Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Interlingo World Lit podcast. I'm Lisa Carter, founder and creative director of Interlingo. And today I'm so happy to have two guests, both author and translator, which are my favorite interviews to do, to hear both perspectives. Um, so we have Natalia Borges Poleso from Brazil. And Julia Sanchez is the translator uh, from the US and we're talking about the collection of stories Amora. So thank you both for being here. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you for having us, Lisa. Yeah, it's really great. So, um, you know, Natalia, you and I were just commenting before uh, a moment ago, you know, it's July 2020. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the world is in an absolutely mad and crazy place um, with the pandemic that, <laughs> that's going on. You're in Brazil, of course, where things are, are really difficult. Julia, you're in the U.S. where things are also <laughs> really difficult. Um, how are you both doing? How are you finding it to, to be in quarantine and to work and to, to focus on art and literature these days? Want to start, Julia? Um, okay. <laughs> so I, I'm a translator and I've worked from home a lot. And at some point in the last year, I realized that I'm not suitable to working from home. So mm -hmm. I had a co-working space and that just sort of leveled my, it just balanced my life in a way that I had found that I needed um, set boundaries. And then the pandemic happened and I no longer had access to my co-working space. And I had to sort of try to figure out once again to like, not let my work life completely consume my personal life, which is where I used to struggle before. Um, I have to be reminded constantly that we are in a state of emergency and so that there is all of this noise at the back of my head that is really preventing me to, preventing me from working uh, at my full, at full capacity. Mm. Like I, there are days when I just can't work. I sit at my computer and I try to translate words and I feel that everything that I'm translating is missing the mark just slightly because mm. I've got like this simmering anxiety. That said, in, in Providence, um, which is where I'm based, uh, we're not in such a terrible place. Our governor has done a pretty good job. Um, and so long as I don't think too hard of the future and I just sort of focus on a small space around me then I I find that I actually I can I'm doing all right if I start trying to think of like my family and when I'm going to see them again then I get very anxious yeah absolutely yeah oh well there are many aspects I guess <laughs> for uh, to 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 approach this what i'm feeling mm. at the moment but for example my routine has not changed a lot because i used to work i'm used to work from home i worked mm -hmm. from home uh, sometimes i had to go to the university i had a, i have a room there and sometimes i have to teach a, a course but it's like last semester i didn't have to teach a course so i was mostly at home uh, but all the um, literary events, book fairs, and, and all these this things um, have been canceled or, or postponed. So uh, for that part, it's kind of sad because I, I liked a lot to be in this kind of situation, this kind of events with people and uh, book signing or everything, like all these things that are uh the good part of literature i guess where mm -hmm. we meet the readers and these are all online now they're happening remotely so that is mm -hmm. kind of sad uh and there is this uh this constant fear of uh, of the future the fear of what is happening to the world and and how people are um 
caring about that or not caring at all and this worries me and also have this this feeling that's that the things might go wrong all the time mm-hmm. so but oh, um not like julia i'm working a lot like i think mm. i became a, a workaholic i have to remind myself that i have to stop working stop writing stop doing things because for example on, on sunday i i was telling myself okay it's sunday i'm not going to do anything i'm going to just watch a movie or drink something or cook but then i was like trying to find something to do trying to work or something like that so this is also bad this is not good mm-hmm. like because i'm feeling really tired yeah no doubt uh-huh is it work as escapism yeah exactly so amora came out in in may is it in yeah english yeah. May. yeah. Mm-hmm. And were you able to have any any launches for it? Any conversations with readers so far? No. <laughs> uh, we had. I had a. Uh, actually, I ha- I had some nice reviews. That was nice, and some radio shows, but and podcasts, but not in anything like with the readers Hmm. yeah that i i know i've heard from from a number of authors and and translators as well that that you know that's really hard um to to not have that interaction yeah this is this is sad because uh this is a very nice part of all the process of a book Mm -hmm. when you meet the readers when you're there and there is a kind of a um, public reading and a party and at least here in Brazil we do this <laughs> there is like a small party in the bookshops sure so yeah. this is nice yeah well we'll try and and uh, encourage listeners here to to reach out in comments or other ways so that uh, you know definitely there's that interaction and and communication between the the writer and uh, and translator and reader. It's a really important part of reading, I think. Very rewarding. Mm, great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so Amora, it's a collection of of stories. Um, the way that you know the the blurb on the back cover reads, and the way that everyone is going to read it can be different. Um, I definitely saw it as um, stories of love, stories of women, but what really hit me as a reader um, were the notions of identity and and the sense of becoming, um, Mm -hmm. becoming who we are. Uh, Each of the characters, or many of them anyhow, went through this process. I'd love to hear how both of you describe the book. Okay. Um, I don't know. Can I start, Julia? Yeah. Or yes, yes, to? please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard because we're not seeing each other. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, um, I wrote Amora in, I started thinking about Amora as a project in 2012. So now it's almost, it's eight years uh, time and I think things have changed a lot in this period um, so for me a model was more like um, the absence of reference the absence of uh, this kind of characters and this this kind of journeys that they go through of their discovery or or knowing who you are for me mm. it was more about that uh, of course there are authors and at the time there were uh, books but it was hard to to find them i think i think things have changed a lot uh here at least uh, for the last five years i guess now we have more uh, options uh, and this is what i research about also so mm. um 
for me it was interesting to create these characters and the stories came after <laughs> mm -hmm. so i wanted to have this queer kid that see that sees a strange figure strange between commas i'm doing commas here okay mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which is in the short story fluid for example and she is bewildered by this figure she wants to know about her and then she hears this word mashoha and she wants to know what is it so and then we have the old couples uh or the old characters that also was something uh, that when we think about literature in literature that has lesbian as uh, as main characters people go straight to people go straight is <laughs> it's very nice people go directly to uh, a sexuality matter or yes. their young uh, women discovering their sexuality and I, I wanted to run away from this I wanted to write about other things that's why I'm I always have this always know but mostly I have this family context uh, the characters are related like to their mothers and grandmothers and aunts and I think this gives a nice perspective on how their personality uh, develops during the story or during that moment. So for me, Amora was about that, was about exploring this kind of uh, constructions. Mm, that's great. And it's so true as well, what you say, you know, publishing is such a long process and publishing in translation adds on even years more. Um, it was probably a very, a very different situation when, when you started writing. Yeah, it was published here in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, okay. well, uh, also it, it was something, it was something here, Amada, like people talked about it. Um, yes and then i i'm i'm actually uh i was nervous uh once it was it was out in the states and uk because i was thinking about this time gap uh if it would be it if it would still be important if it would still mean something and i guess it does <laughs> mm, i i think it does absolutely <laughs> yeah Julia, how do you describe the book when you're talking to people as a, from the reader perspective and translator perspective? I mean, what uh, Natalia was talking about is something that really drew me to the book, which is um, sort of moving away from the central theme of a queer novel being sexuality. These are all, you know, women who are lesbians, but also women who are friends and daughters and partners and kids who play you know chess and um it create it creates this very beautiful uh and very interconnected universe um so that it feels it feels sort of anti-isolating mm. to have um these stories um i i read the book many years ago and the first um story i translated was float um and I submitted that around to, to literary journals and eventually it was published in Electric Literature. And I think I liked that story in particular because also of the, 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 the challenge of translating it um, because it centers around this word that I chose, mashoha, which I chose to leave untranslated because I thought that um, the context was uh, sort of illuminating enough and also I sometimes I toy with the idea of leaving in foreign words as a way to emphasize how large and diverse Brazil is mm -hmm. like I my family is from Sao Paulo and so my Portuguese is Paulista and her Portuguese is a world different to mine yeah. um, but sometimes when you translate things into English that that um enormous range gets lost um and i think yeah that would the the um, float is one of my favorite stories and i also really like amara and i really like um the one that uh, that natalia is going to read later um 
yeah, it just sort of decentralizes uh, queer narratives from like the very, the one that we see most often in media, which is, you know, coming out and the, um, the sort of challenge and difficulty and like horror story that it can be to come out, but doesn't necess isn't necessarily the center of everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there is something also because uh, sometimes you don't need to come out to be gay, <laughs> I mean, this is something real for 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 people, and and so that is in the book too. Um, I, there's so many things I want to pick up on there. Um, you know, when I was reading the the book, um, a couple of times, definitely in the first section. So the book is divided into two sections, and in the, the all of the stories in the first part, Natalia, you were saying that. Um, all of the characters are seen in family situations or in friendships and, you know, sort of the larger scope of their lives. And to me, at one point, I remember going back and looking and thinking, are these the same? Is there a similar character throughout? Because there is that connection, that whole connected universe, I think that you were saying too, Julia, um, they, feel, they feel very connected. The stories are different, but there is this element that runs through um, that actually had me go back and check and say, wait a minute, is this a different person <laughs> <laughs> or not? Um, it's that universal experience, I guess. Yeah, I thought about it when I was writing, um, like to have um, something that continues, you know, something that oh, people might think that this is the same character uh, as a as a kid, and then as a as a university student, and then old. I thought of it, but I think that co that comes. Um, across as an uh, experience mostly because of of my writing actually of my own experience maybe mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a lesbian woman mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we can share that that is something that we can share with other people something that is similar the experiences are are similar so maybe is that maybe is that feeling I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was definitely just a sense. So, so I wonder if that's it. I loved it. Um, as you said, Natalia, when the book came out, you won almost every literary prize available in Brazil with this book. What do you feel that it was that connected so strongly and so deeply with critics and with readers? I think it, it, it's a it's a set of, of things. Um, I, I think Amara came in the right came out in the right moment. Um, also, there is this research. There is a, a professor here at the Universidade de Brasília, and she has a, a very thorough research. Like she uh, goes over uh, twenty years of novels published by the, the biggest uh, publishing houses here in Brazil. And she, she, the, res, the result is like, we have mostly white male, um, white men from Rio Sao Paulo, aged 40 years old as writers and mm -hmm. as characters. And this is crazy for like, Brazil is a very diverse country. Uh, so I guess Amara is part of this, um, of breaking this, of trying to change this, these things. But also it came out, uh, it was published by a very nice publishing house, uh, which, is, which is not a big one, but it's a very uh, careful one, I guess. They, the, the, the project of the book was very nice also. It has mm -hmm. like hardcover. Beautiful. It's beautiful, yeah. Uh, 
so it's a, it's a nice object when people got to 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 grab it they they always told me like oh it's the book is beautiful the book itself the object mm -hmm. is beautiful um well, well, there is this, there is the, the, the amount of energy and that the publishers uh, spend uh, in, in advertising to, because these are things that are important for mm -hmm. a life of a book. The book doesn't go by mm -hmm. itself uh, around the, the world. So there were lots of of factors, I guess, that helped a mother to get where it it is now. Mm. It's a nice path. I recognize. I, I'm very proud of this book, and um, I think there until now it's been five years of it. Uh, it was published here in Brazil, and I guess there is every other day I get a message from someone saying yeah. that they read this or that story and they relate or they loved it or they were that the story remind uh, them of something else or something that they lived or a friend lived so I don't know how to explain that mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's something that happens and um, I think all this efforts to 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 have the book the book in in places to distribute the book in a yes. in a good way are also a part of of a modest path. Mm. That's amazing. That's wonderful that you you are hearing from people constantly. Yeah. Yeah. I still do. It's amazing. <laughs> That's fantastic. And Julia, you said you read the book soon after it came out, I guess, or and I think so I am um... I go to Brazil once a year to see family and I usually do a big book haul mm. and um, I assume that someone at a bookstore recommended it to me and I brought it home and I read a couple of stories and I think at some point contacted a poet I know who lives in Porto Alegre who then put me in touch with Natalia okay. and I translated the first story and I think separately the rights were sold to Amazon. Um, okay. So it was before any of the, uh, before my translation of Float had been published. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was really excited to read uh, work by a queer author in Brazil. There, There is a history of it. It's just not as prominent as it is in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you said you published the one in Electric Literature. I think you've published other stories as well. So then how did the connection get made with, with the, the English publisher with Amazon Crossing? I don't know. Okay. It, it was, <laughs> I, I guess I told them because um, the rights were sold and my editor, ha I, he was like in charge of the rights. And then he told me about Amazon Crossing. And then I, I said, well, send Julia's material and contact her. <laughs> because she already did a nice, a very nice yes. job. So that's fantastic. It's uh, it it's wonderful when, um, yeah, those synchronicities sort of happen. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. One of the other things you mentioned, um, Julia, is this um, the fact of leaving certain words in Portuguese um, throughout the book at every now and then. Um, I don't know Portuguese, I know Spanish, I have Brazilian friends, you know, so I can pick up on some of the words, some of the words, not at all. But as you said, you don't need to, you understand what's there. But I think it adds so much to have the original words there. And that's true of, of the title of the book as well, isn't it? I mean, anyone who is familiar with romance languages can probably figure amora has something to do with love, amor, you know, mm -hmm. French, Spanish. Um, but um, was, was that an intentional choice by you, Julia, as well? And, uh, you know, what did you want to convey by leaving some of those words there? Um, so, there's a lot of discussion in translation about whether that is exoticizing mm -hmm. or um, 
maybe even more diff like radical in a different way. Um, my intention is never to exoticize, but to sort of point out that English is not this monolingual monolith, if that makes sense. Like English as the lingua franca, as the language of empire is spoken by people, is spoken by more people as a second language than it is as a first language. Mm -hmm. um, and Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese is also not a monolith. Like depending, you don't have to go far for the grammar to change and for the vocabulary to be wildly different. And so for Mashoha, it was, I couldn't, I also couldn't find anything that I felt was an appropriate translation. I did try to find a word that I thought might work and I, didn't think anything captured it as well as Mashoha. I also asked around to people I knew whether they understood this word, like different generations of Brazilians from different parts of the country don't quite know what it is. And I think okay. if I'm remembering correctly, the origin might be Spanish. Don't, don't quote me on that. I think <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to do some more research. I can't remember anymore. Um, and Amada, it's so, especially, I translate into North American English. And in the US, an enormous part of the population speaks Spanish. Um, and imagining that I'm translating to a bunch of like white middle class monolingual women is not always the best way forward. Um, and there's, you know, one of my favorite stories in here is called Amada, so it does refer back to a person as well. So if I had translated it differently, I feel like I would have lost mm. that. Um, and yeah, so that's, I think that was my logic behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the most obvious translation for Amada would be really misleading, I guess. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's for the what whole I... Book. That's what I understand. So what is the most common translation of it? Because Amara is a, a fruit, right? A fruit. It's, it's a, a berry. Yeah. Blackberry would be, I guess. What I is it? So. Gooseberry. I don't know. I think it's I blackberry. Don't know. <laughs> blackberry. Yeah, yeah, it would be really misleading. Yeah. Right. Um, I think in that case, you either... I mean, I feel like Amada works really well as a title and I will stick by it <laughs> in English. <laughs> but, no, good um, for you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, I would have gone with something completely different, something from another part that referred to another part of the book, perhaps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. rather than just translating it as Barry, which would make absolutely no sense. <laughs> <laughs> in Spanish, is also a mod, and I don't think that there is... Uh, the word exists in Spanish, I guess, is something else. Mm -hmm. I think mora, in, yeah, is blackberry. But without the A, right? Yeah, just without the A, yeah, oh, mora. mora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So you're going to um, both read, um, I don't know if it's a whole piece or the introduction to a piece, but Natalia, you're going to read in Portuguese and then Julia, your English translation. Yeah, um, I'll read uh, the short story called Vó, a senhora lésbica. <laughs> but just the first part. Um, so, Vó, a senhora lésbica. Vó Clarissa deixou cair os talheres no prato fazendo a porcelana estalar. Joaquim, meu primo, continuava com o queixo suspenso, batendo com o garfo nos lábios, esperando a resposta. Beatriz ecoou a palavra como pergunta. O que é lésbica? Eu fiquei muda. Joaquim sabia sobre mim e me entregaria para a avó, e mais tarde para toda a família. Senti um calor letal subir pelo meu pescoço e me doer atrás das orelhas. Previ a cena. Vó, a senhora é lésbica? Porque a Joana é. A vergonha estava na minha cara e me denunciava antes mesmo da delação. Apertei os olhos e contraí o peito, esperando o tiro. Atrás das minhas pálpebras, Thaís e eu nos beijávamos escondidas no último corredor da área de humanas da biblioteca da faculdade. Abri os olhos novamente 
e meio, e meio tonta, vi que a minha avó continuava de olhos baixos, Joaquim continuava brincando com o garfo nos lábios e Beatriz apenas sacudia as pernas curtas sobre a cadeira. Beautiful. Um, Grandma, are you a lesbian? Grandma Clarissa's cutlery fell on her plate, making the porcelain ding. My cousin Joaquin's jaw still hung open, his fork smacking against his lips as he waited for her answer. Beatriz echoed the word in question form. What's a lesbian? I stayed quiet. Joaquin knew he was going to tell Grandma, and then the whole family on me. A deathly heat climbed up my neck, making the area behind my ears hurt. I pictured the scene unfolding before me. Grandma, are you a lesbian? Because Joanna is. Shame plastered on my face, betraying me before the betrayal. I squeezed my eyes shut and drew my chest in, waiting for the shot to fire. Behind my eyelids, Thais and I kissed in the last row of the humanities section of the college library. I opened my eyes again and dizzily saw my grandma, her gaze still low, Joaquin still smacking his lips with his fork, and Beatriz barely kicking her small legs on the chair. That's fantastic. I love that. <clears throat> um, the, the beginning part of the book has more traditional short stories, um, style at least in terms of, of the way they're written. The second part of the book is, is more experimental, more literary, more um, micro or flash fiction, almost poetry. Um, personally, I completely adored the whole book, but the second part, there was something so, there is something so strong about short pieces, what you can convey in a tiny glimpse. Um, I'd love to hear Natalia just about the writing of the, the two parts. Did you always intend to have this sort of counterplay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, this second part, the, the uh, short and tart. Short and tart, What yeah. is it? What is yeah. it called again? <laughs> yes, I think it's short and tart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Short and tart versus big and juicy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they are more like my first book more what my first book uh was is like which is this kind of uh, flash fiction this kind of poetic exercises of uh, imagery construction of, of images and i like that a lot uh, actually i i try to do that every day i try to think about mm -hmm. literature as an exercise and not necessarily uh, produce a story with the beginning and, and, and an ending. So, and sometimes I use these parts in different uh, other fictions that I am uh, building. So I tend to do these exercises. And I, there, there's this, um, this writer, this Argentinian writer called Julio Cortázar, which I love. And he has this kind of short, short stories mm. that are very imagetic. Uh, so I might, I might have tried to mimic something uh, like that. And also, I, I think I was inspired by uh, Lydia, Lydia Dave's Lydia mm. Dave stories. She has this, this short, pungent uh, pieces of, of fictions, this, this, I don't know. I like that a lot. This for me, it's a nice exercise. Yeah, I love them. They're just fantastic. <laughs> what about you, Julia? Do you lean one way or the other? And what was it like to translate? You know, the the different styles in the book. So that's the tricky thing about short story collections. With a novel, you sort of get a voice and you get a style and you just carry it through to the very end. Mm -hmm. With short fiction, you have to like reinvent the wheel every five pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually quite challenging because you, there are different voices, there are different personalities and characters you have to inhabit. Um, and I think at some point, um, pretty early on, I realized that the, there's a specific 
tone and style to the to the first um, half. Um, it's very sort of loose and colloquial, so that's mm -hmm. something that I try to to, um, to carry into the English. Um, there's a there's a good amount of slang. Um, there are sentences with just really like dynamic grammar and syntax. Um, and in the second half, it's a it being you know flash fiction. You have to be a lot more controlled. Um, so every weight. That every word is weightier in a way. Um, I love flash fiction. Lydia Davis is one of my favorite authors. Um, it feels somewhere between pro poetry and prose, which I also um, is my favorite kind of thing to translate. Um, so it was, I did, I definitely, I mean, I had to change gears in this book several times, but I definitely <laughs> had to do something very different at the end in translating it. Um, I also really, really enjoy these these um, these last few pieces because they're sort of they're more associative in a way. Like their words take you to other ideas, um, which is really, really challenging to translate because obviously, yes, the etymologies are not the same. You don't have the same connections between word and sound and meaning. But um, yeah, it was very. It was a it was a delightful challenge. Mm, yeah, it would be. Have you, Julia, translated any of Natalia's other um, pieces from her earlier work? No, Either? no, not yet. Um, I'll send it. I'll send them to you. <laughs> yes, you. <we're> <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's Hecarchus, right? Yeah, yeah, the name is very. It would be a challenge already because it's Records para Album de Fotografia Sem Gente. Yep. <laughs> That's all you're gonna say about that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Julia. Mean, it's, you know, translators put so much time into figuring things out so that when people put yeah. me on the spot and are like, how are you gonna translate this? I'm like, I don't know. You know like, Give me several months to think about it and then I'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. That's funny because uh, earlier Julie and I were also sharing how, you know, translator brain and interpreter brain on the spot immediate are, are very different. So, <laughs> yeah. And Natalia, you're a translator as well. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> I am working on that. <laughs> no, I... I... I used to do this kind of uh, academic translation that not literary, which is completely different. Like have to be more practical. And, and then I started doing fiction, translating fiction, and then some books fell <laughs> in my lap, on my lap. And I, and I had a good experience. I mm -hmm. recently translated uh, Sandra Cisneros, The House on Mango Street. Fantastic. Yeah. So I, if you have the chance to read my translation, Julia, read and don't tell me what you think. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a it was a pleasure translating this book because I had read that uh, a long time ago in English and it was beautiful. Mm. And then it was I think it was the first translation that I really enjoyed a lot. Uh, because before that, I translated uh, Us and Them by Bahina Giovanni. And that was insane, because there is this us uh, that made everything difficult <laughs> in Portuguese. Okay, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, I, I like it. I like it. I'm a bit traumatized uh, with the French to Portuguese translation, but um, I'm working on that too. <laughs> I had a very bad experience. Okay, that's never good. And what yeah. was the collaboration like between you in terms of, of Amora? Um, we talked. A few, a few questions at the end. I have this like overwhelming fear that if I barrage authors with too many questions, they'll hate me forever. <laughs> so I like, I squirrel them away until the very end of a project. And then I send a lengthy email being like, just clarify these things. Um, 
for me and she was very helpful and very um, quick to respond, which was great. Um, <laughs> I've had authors before who I've had to like get on WhatsApp and like authors, especially on American authors who send me lengthy WhatsApp messages, like voice messages with their <laughs> responses, which is great because you get to hear the cadence of their voices while they're explaining things, but also not so helpful because they go away after a while. And then I, I like having, again, I do written translation. I like having things on paper <laughs> that I can follow. Yeah. Um, but I've often, I've often found that the best authors to work with, like Natalia, are, are people who also translate because they know what it means. And like, so they know sort of the liberties that can be taken, um, but they'll, they're also very um, gentle when uh, telling you, no, maybe that was too far. <laughs> Bring it back a little. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, it's, it's different working with someone who has excellent knowledge of English and translates as opposed to someone who has excellent, thinks they have excellent knowledge of English, but doesn't translate and then think they're making your improvements on your text and they're just making it very bad. And Natalia was not that. Natalia was wonderfully respectful. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Julia, we had, a, we had a very long ex uh, email ex exchange uh, about profanação, I guess. Oh, yes, that too. That was a long conversation, right? About the... And that was when Lisa, uh, Liza, Liza Darnton was um, yeah. adding that conversation too, which was really helpful. Yeah, but that was very interesting because I've never thought of that problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it, it meant something. It was really something that we should talk about. And, and in the end, after we talked about lots of things i think that the, it was the simpler answer yes wasn't it? it often is <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's often the simplest answer and liza was really great too she was from the beginning obviously really in love with the project um mm. and yeah just a great person to work with yeah mm. i thought so too yeah i'm of the i'm of the mind that translations are rarely the product of one person. Like obviously you have the relationship with the author and the, and the translator. So there are already two people there to start, but then um, there's the editor and then there's mm -hmm. the copy editor and then there's the proofreader. Yeah. And it's just like a whole army of people working to bring works into translation. And I like, mm -hmm. it, may, it, may, it feels less isolating if you think of everyone else who's participating in this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and for you, Natalia, how does the book feel for you in English? Is it a very different um, product, a very different um, beast than than the book in in the original? It is, and it is not. It's yeah. funny because uh, I I read it in English, and I read it when Julia sent me the first. Uh, the first version and then I read again when I like to read myself sorry <laughs> I read it again when it was like printed and I had these different uh, feelings or something that I I had to go and find in the original to say did I say that and then yes I said that I <laughs> I didn't remember I had, that was not what I meant but yes I yes it came across uh, as this and also I had a very interesting experience I was taking some English classes um, last month because I thought this kind of interview <laughs> might happen and some English classes might feel like as uh, comfort for me and I read some some parts for this my teacher and my teacher is also a poet and a translator is Sara, I don't know if you know her, Sara Rebecca Kersley. She, she translates, in, who does she translate again? Uh, the name rings a bell. Uh, sorry? The name, the name rings a bell, but. Yeah, she, does, she has, uh, she has a publishing, a very small publisher here and uh, she translates, I guess, uh, 
Bruna, maybe Bruna Beber or mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Anyway, I read uh, her. I read to her some some of the stories in our class, like to practice rhythm because I I read weirdly in in English. I don't know what what happens. I don't have the what is the name of Shakespearean rhythm. I don't remember the this name, but I don't have that. And then I read to her, and as I was reading, she was, oh, yeah, oh, my God. And, I, and then, haven't you read the book? I asked her in Portuguese, and she said, yes, I did, but in English, it, it sounds different. It's, it's more meaningful to me because <laughs> she's English, and she had a, a different experience. So I think this is something really beautiful about uh, translation because people mm -hmm. ha really have uh, a different experience. Mm -hmm. This is nice. It is. And I think, you know, as you were saying at the beginning too, like when you hear from readers, I, I personally, I believe that every reader um, has a completely different experience of, of every book because we all have our own, our own past, our own beliefs, our own way of, of thinking and being. Um, and uh, so now you just have multiplied that in terms of the number of ways yeah. this book can be read. Yeah, this is amazing. This is really amazing. As for language and also, th there is something that is happening uh, now, five years after Amora had been published, that young lesbian, young queer women uh, find that the book is not lesbian enough. Interesting. <laughs> that puzzled me. And they told, and I saw the, um, I, I, I usually watch the videos when someone talks about Amora and things. I try to keep track. And they say, oh, because the women here, they are not openly gay or they are in a situation where they are performing heterosexuality. Mm. And then I, I, I think to, to myself, like, yes, it's correct, but that doesn't mean that the person is less of a lesbian, <laughs> less of a queer woman or gay. So this is interesting. It's also a different perspective. Yes, yeah, different generations. Generational, yeah, generational perspective. How interesting. That's, mm -hmm. huh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I loved Amora. I loved everything about it. Um, I sincerely hope to read more of your work in English, Natalia, in, in your translation, Julia. I, I look forward to, to the possibility of that at the very least. Um, but for now, it's really wonderful to have Amora in English. Very happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, thank you both so much for speaking with me today. I think I could talk for ages more, but uh, I'm sure you have other things <laughs> to get back to. Um, but it's been really wonderful to hear your perspective about the book. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And, and you are good at the podcast.